Jamia Adams. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming out for the Politicon panelists on Me Too. Um, we are going to have our panelists come on out. Um, we have Emiliana Gareca. She is the founder and executive director of Women's March of Los Angeles. And next we have Professor Michelle Dauber, founder of Enough is Enough Project. And we have Amy Allison, who is the president of Democracy of, uh, in Color and founder of She. And last but not least, we have Rachel Carmona, who is the COO of Women's March Inc. Thank you to all the panelists for participating today. We're going to have um, each of the panelists do a short introduction of themselves and I'm going to ask a few questions and then we're going to leave some time for the audience to ask some questions at the last 15 minutes of our panel. We want to make sure that you know you all are here watching but you're also participating as well. Um, so first we're going to have Emiliana Gareca. Will you introduce yourself and just let us know a little bit about your work. We all have read her great bio in the app. I know you've all downloaded the app. But tell us about some of the things that you're working on now and as it relates to this panel topic around Me Too. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Emiliana Guareca, also known as Emmy. I am the founder of Women's March of Los Angeles. Um, I am an um, immigrant. Um, for me, I currently consider myself an activist, but a community activist. Um, for me, Me Too to the polls, is clearly a call to action of, of holding our, our, our politicians accountable. Um, as a female activist, I'm donating my time, I'm donating my time to fix the mistakes of paid politicians. So I am, I am dedicating right now my time and all of my efforts to making sure that we build a pipeline of women that look like me, that look like everyone on this panel, to run for office, and that is my life's work. Great, thank you so much, Juliana. And Professor um, Michelle, I'm going to call you Michelle because I think we're friends right now. Um, your work at Stanford is just amazing, and the accountability work. Can you talk a little bit about that story and the work that you've been doing um, in this effort? Sure. So uh, thank you very much, and thanks very much to Politicon and to Women's March LA for having this panel and for letting me participate in it. Um, I am, as you said, a professor of law at Stanford Law School, and um, I uh, chaired the campaign last year uh, for the recall of Judge Aaron Kursky, who was the judge in the Thank you. I think that was a necessary exercise in accountability. And um, actually, that was a, a large-scale community effort that was supported by many uh, women's organizations, many leaders of Women's March in the Bay Area and around the country, the feminist majority, um, and organized labor. Um, so it was a broad-based coalition effort. Um, and coming out of that, um, what the leadership group of um, our organization uh, wanted to do was um, continue the effort to try to um, harness the legitimate anger of women and other people because it isn't just women who experience sexual violence and um, sexual harassment, but to harness the legitimate anger over those kinds of violations of human dignity and um, translate it into actionable electoral behavior. So for you know at least 100 years, um, really beginning with the abolition movement, uh, women and allies have highlighted uh, the problem of sexual violence. And in that time, we've tried a lot of things. We have written laws, we have tried to enforce those laws, we have founded C3s and nonprofit organizations, we've become court volunteers, um, we've tried to become court advocates, um, we've pressed for the laws to be enforced when they weren't enforced. Essentially, we've played a 100 year long game of whack a mole with the system. And um, our idea is simple, which is let's go. Let's get some democracy around the question of whether we have to continue to accept 
having a system that is not responsive to the most grievous um, personal violations that many women and also, as I said, other individuals experience. Um, so uh, we founded the Enough is Enough Voter Project, um, which is a new political action committee. And uh, you can stop by the Women's March booth um, over there and get some information about it. Um, and uh, we have right now, uh, in this cycle, um, six, six races in five states um, where we are participating in independent expenditures against uh, elected officials who have been uh, uh, accused credibly, often found responsible for sexual violence or um, domestic violence or um, sexual harassment, or they simply always vote the wrong way on the issue. Um, or have said things that degrade women and degrade um, the experience of sexual violence. So we feel that by targeting these individuals and by encouraging people to come out and vote on this issue, um, and we think that this is an issue that is especially important based on our you know, experience with the recall to voters of color and women of color, and that's not surprising actually because um, those, those groups of people tend to be more likely to be victimized. Um, and uh, as well as some other groups, um, transgender individuals and um, disabled individuals. So we hope to raise awareness uh, around this issue by voting on it, and um, that's our campaign. Thank you. And next up, we have Amy Allison, who's the founder of the amazing She the People. Anyone here in the audience attended She the People this year? I know I did. It was amazing. Um, can you talk to us about your work um, particularly as a voice for folks who are people of color within this movement. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to see you here. Thank you so much. And to the panelists, Politicon and Women's March. Uh, I'm President of Democracy and Color and founder of She the People. We had our inaugural event in San Francisco earlier this year on the wake of, the, of speaking at the San Francisco's Women's March in which my message was, 2018 is the year of women of color. So get in formation behind women of color. We came, we showed up, we're the most uh, solid progressives at the polls. For every, uh, uh, for, for every 100 uh, women who become eligible to vote since 2010, 70% have been women of color, we're the fastest growing group. And the future of our country is multiracial. And the future of our identity as women is multiracial. We are not a minority. We're actually the majority. We're the force behind progressive wins and polls. <laughs> she the People elevates the voice of women of color. We're the least represented elected officials and the most uh, talented strategists who know how to inspire and win at the polls an inclusive multiracial coalition, not just in California, but in places like uh, Texas and, and Florida and Georgia, where I've been advising Stacey Abrams, who's in a battle to become the first black woman governor uh, in the history of that state. But I want to talk to you about Alabama, because she the people is, uh, you might say, okay, well, it's about elevating women of color. Uh, but the first time the country started seriously thinking about women of color was black women in the wake of the special election last December, remember that? In 2017. And in that uh, Senate race in Alabama, uh, you had a child molester, a lawyer would say suspected child molester, but there were a lot of victims who came forward. And I tend to believe the victims. And then you had a moderate, white guy Democrat who was using an old playbook to win a state that had been uh, dominated by the GOP for 25 years. And uh, Democrats typically will run in a state in the Deep South by trying to appeal to white, moderate voters. They spend a lot, in fact, they, in 2016, the year where our uh, illusions about that strategy crumbled around us. In 2016, out of the billion and a half dollars spent on campaigning, 70% was spent on wooing moderate white voters, television ads mostly, and some digital ads. And we know how that turned out. But in Alabama, something different happened. Democracy in Color and a, a group of very innovative people funded an independent expenditure 
run by black women from Alabama, people like Dewana Thompson, and people uh, who are uh, leaders in terms of a strategy. And they used and, and maximized a network uh, led by black women that turned out the black vote in record numbers two weeks before Christmas. And the turnout in the high 96% was high enough to win that state. And black women are 14% of the population there. Black people, 28%. And yet they were able to win based on elevating the leadership, voice, and perspective of black women and black people in the Deep South. After the win in Alabama was the first time the country was like, you know, you know, the, the so-called experts and the people who write about politics and the taste make makers and the people who, who talk about the horse race were shocked at the results of the Alabama victory, but it showed us one thing that when women of color and black women are activated and invested in, we win elections. But no one yet has talked about the power of the Latina in Texas, the power of the Latina in a place like Arizona. These are two places where Trump won in 2016, where the population of Latinas alone were enough to overcome uh, the vote gap difference in 2018 where they have statewide races. Beto O'Rourke, for example, the, uh, the gubernatorial race in, in uh, Arizona, another example. And look at, uh, at, at Florida, a place where the GOP has won by 1%. That's 40,000 votes, and they've been dominating, slashing health care, slashing uh, education. And so we are at a moment where you have uh, women of color who are most progressive and likely to respond at the polls. So I just want to share one other thing about Alabama. If you go back in time in Alabama, there's a long history of black women trying to seek justice for being victims of sexual violence. I think it was Oprah, wasn't it, that told the story? Was it the Golden Globes or something about Recy Taylor in the 1950s? She was gang raped by a group of white men and sought justice. It was the NAACP who came and uh, to that state uh, long before the Montgomery bus boycott and, and those pivotal moments in the civil rights, it was, it was uh, looking for and seeking justice for black women who were victims of that violence uh, that led to uh, organizing. And the women of Alabama still come from that long tradition. That's why black women, not white women, let's be clear, the majority of black women responded to defeat the GOP child molester in Alabama. And so we need to look to, in terms of the Me Too movement, started by Toronto Burke, continuing to seek, seek justice for young girls of color, all the way to victory to the polls. If we focus on and elevate in the leadership, women of color, we have a path to victory. And for those who are trying to, to uh, minimize or say Me Too has gone too far, or they're uh, taking innocent men down, and all the spectacle we just saw with Kavanaugh, we have the political power to organize across race and to win. So that's what She the People is about, and I'm looking forward to the conversation here. is uh, a group that's very personal to be my uh, three good friends of mine are the co-chairs, the national co-chairs of Women's March, and I volunteered on the first inaugural communications committee. So I really appreciate Women's March and just the, the powerful movement that you all are helping to push forth. Can you tell us a little bit about the work you're currently doing? Yeah, yeah, so thank you and thank you all for uh, joining us today. And thanks to everyone on the panel, and of course, uh, Women's March LA for uh, setting it up. My name is Rachel Carmona. Um, my role with Women's March is to um, create an institution that started as a disruption, which um, for me is fun. My background is I have about 20 years of organizing in communities um, and a master's degree that studies uh, nonprofit management and also um, building networks. And so this is a different, it's a moment in time that is very different from other moments in time because often we see institutions being built and then from there a march or from there a mobilization. But Women's March started as a decentralized movement of the people in the streets. 
and grew from there. And so now, as we're moving forward, some of the questions of what comes next for Me Too or things like that are involved with how do we channel, how do we channel, cha channel excuse me, that um, momentum into actual long-term sustained power. And um, there are some movements that have done it, I would argue not um, a lot in the United States at the scale that we are working at right now. And so we're really in uncharted waters. And um, I have the honor of being able to work with a lot of the folks who are in different communities and working at the national level who are making that happen. And so for us, when we're moving forward and we're thinking about what that looks like, we're thinking about the history and understanding and knowing that, for example, Rosa Parks was one of the initial investigators of these sexual violence that were used as political um, in, in coercion and intimidation in the South. And understanding that we know that um, the stories that we have heard are only part of our own history, our own legacy as organizers and as activists, and understanding that Rosa Parks was somebody who was trained and in turn trained and used those skills to create decentralized networks of women specifically, but of folks in general and other organizers much like her, you know, all over the South and other places in the country, and really leaning into the power of the people because at Women's March we believe that the people who are closest to the problem are the people who are closest to the solution. And that is our theory of change. So we have a mission, like all organizations have a mission, we're going to help women um, bring about change in their communities, but for too long that change has been um, assumed to, to go through powerful institutions or other people in power that we would, we would try to um, lobby for people to recognize our rights and to recognize our basic humanity in those days, just so everyone is clear, everyone who's live streaming on Twitter, those days are done. And what you've seen in the last two years is that three of the four largest mass mobilizations in this, this country have been led by Women's March, beginning with the first one, with the second one that was actually larger, and with the walkouts that were planned by a lovely, our lovely Tabitha uh, Jacobs in the, in the audience here, that uh, was the largest walkout in history with near, numbers nearing two million. So we are here, and it's not just about numbers, although numbers are important, it's about that those numbers translate into a power and a, and a momentum and a moment in time where we are able to capture the public narrative, we are able to move the needle, and we are able to say what's on the agenda and what's not. And we plan to continue to use that power moving forward into the midterms, January of next year when we take the streets again and heading forward into 2020. And if you're not with us, you're against us because there's no middle ground in this time right now where we are fighting for our rights and fighting for our survival. In fact, as Trump is taking aim at trans people and people of color and women and women's rights, even just today, you know, more news every day. So there's, you're, you're either in it or you're out. And, and for us, when we're looking back and we're saying, where do we want, what story are we gonna tell in 10 years? Is the story of like, yeah, that was a really hard time and I was really gripped with, you know, fear as I watched this unfold on my couch, looking at my, face, my friend's Facebook status, or are we gonna say, I was out in the streets, I gave money, I canvassed, I worked for my elected official, I volunteered, I lobbied, everything that I could possibly do, I did, because I'm an active part of the future that we are building right now, and be, you know, let's be clear, we are in a moment in time, we are at a tipping point in this country, and, our, and the future is ours. So, Women's March is here to make sure that women's voices and we are at the lead, and particularly centering the leadership of women of color. I'm really appreciative to be um, with folks here today, and I look forward to the rest of the conversation. So the first question is, how was the, the Me Too movement uh, amplified in the recent Kavanaugh um, protests? Um, Rachel, could you speak to that? And anyone else on the panel would love to contribute to that? I'd love to hear from them as well. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, for me, uh, this actually starts around the um, family detention protests. Because when we were all heading down to DC, we were, all, we were in a caravan heading down to this direct action that we were planning. And while we were down there, probably 15 of us in three cars on the way down is when our phones all pinged and said, Kennedy is stepping down and there's going to be a new justice. And we knew that no matter, we, you know, we knew the short list and we knew that no matter what justice that was going to be, that it was going to mean nothing good for women, not only, but for our democracy because we also came to understand that one of the um, criteria that Trump was looking for was that a justice who held the opinion that the president was above the law. 
and um, what that can mean not only in terms of women and all of the um, kind of judicial uh, priorities that the Trump administration has planned, but also his own, um, you know, machinations around uh, evading accountability for his actions around the Russia investigation. So we knew that there was trouble from the very beginning. And so we had been thinking about, okay, well, what does this mean for us? And we thought, um, we, we were so dismayed because the, the Democrats seemed to just be like, well, that's gonna happen, you know? And we were like, no, <laughs> you know? And, and so before we really began to plan these mobilizations that went on for five weeks over the course of um, uh, September and the, and the first week of October, um, we decided this was a hill that, you know, this was, this was a battle that really needed to be fought because, not just because the, the Democrats seem so unwilling to fight it, but because there seemed to be not a lot of political space um, for a, a fight to be had in the, in the broader sector. And so when we went down there, we, had, we went down there with the intention of saying, this is an, a, a strategic escalation. We have been, we have marched, we have rallied, we have done all these things, but as the attacks against our rights continue to escalate, so will our opposition to those attacks. And as you come to, to attempt to try to railroad in a very unorthodox way, um, a candidate who is going to sit, and let's be clear, this is not somebody who's going to go in 2020 or 2022. This is a lifetime appointment that would be a life sentence for women, for people of color, for workers, for the environment, for all of the people um, you know, for whom Kavanaugh is a threat. And we said, okay, this is, this is it. This is a moment, this, this is a stand we're going to take. And so over the course of five weeks, we worked with um, some of our partners, but really worked to organize our network and the network around us for women to continue to be trained in direct action, in civil disobedience, and, 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 to, be, and to be trained to be able to train other people. So not only did we have those actions that were taking place in Washington, D.C., but then all of that community and all of that training and all of that knowledge that went back to the communities all around the country and in the end of those five weeks, ten, over 10,000 women had been through those trainings, women and allies and survivors had been through those trainings and had been a part of that building of power in Washington, D.C. Um, so I'll actually talk, let, let other folks talk about the political implications um, and if there are any other questions about like what it actually looks like in D.C. we can talk. Yeah. I was gonna say that uh, the She the People Summit at the end of uh, September was right in the midst of the conclusion of the Kavanaugh hearings and a few days before Dr. Ford testified. And one of uh, two of our speakers at the event were the first two women, and both women of color, to be arrested in the Kavanaugh hearings, very active in the protests. Linda Sarsour, co-founder, uh, co-chair of the Women's March nationally, and Jennifer Epps Addison, um, CPD uh, co-director, both very courageous women. The thing is, I reminded people as I opened the summit that we're beginning She the People with the importance of our voice and perspective because uh, we have this vision that's bigger than electing Democrats. We have these big visions for our nation, which is that people can live with dignity. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a politics with love and justice infused in its core. And that someone like uh, Kavanaugh, who comes uh, seeking a Supreme Court lifetime appointment, will not go unanswered uh, by uh, our uh, millions of people that we represent. And I reminded the group that in 1991, I was a senior in college, and I really came of age watching Anita Hill at that uh, Senate Judiciary hearing. So for those of you in your late 40s, you might remember also what that was like to watch this uh, young, um, very proper, lawyer, law professor like you, a law professor, very brave, sitting by herself at a table, facing off with white men of both parties, being dismissed and being not believed. I remember what that was like, what that did to me as a young woman. And I remember the organizing that we did after that sham of a, of a, of a, a judicial hearing. I reminded people that it wasn't the end of the story. Clarence Thomas sit, sits on the Supreme Court. What a shame for the nation that this man had been able, able to essentially get away with and justify sexually harassing Anita Hill at, at work. And she was punished for telling the truth. But if you've seen the documentary, then I recommend that you do about what happened in the next 25 years in Anita Hill. You understand what a, a, a leader she's been in creating um, a, a, and advocating for a set of laws that protect 
people at work from the same kind of abuses that she suffered under. And she also gave inspiration at that time for what they called in 1992 the Year of the Woman. And that resulted in organizing at the polls for the very first African American woman to be elected into, into the Senate. Remember her. And so I wanted people to understand that the, the fight with Kavanaugh wasn't going to begin and end at the hearing and the vote. That really when we look at just a few days, is it 16 days right now in our midterms? That the organizing that we've been doing is also an extension of our response. And so the movement is incredibly important because we have to articulate, not only we're not gonna take this lying down, and we're gonna fight the best you know, we can, but also that we have political strategists, the very best. When I say the best, I mean Andrew Mercado, who's organizing uh, in Florida and has uh, is on, on the path to registering and turning out a million additional voters of color in the state of Florida. And you have to watch Florida, Florida's gonna turn blue. And you'll, you can thank women of color who are leading a multiracial coalition to do it. Um, Monse Ada, not in, um, uh, in Arizona, who's leading one Arizona, is gonna turn that state blue by her organizing. Um, Crystal Zerminio down in Texas, you know, I don't know if Beto's gonna win or, or, or lose. Trump won by 800,000 votes, that's a huge vote gap. But whatever he does will be because women of color have led the coalition in a state like Texas. Um, and so I wanna lift those up and say the Kavanaugh story isn't the end it is, uh, it is continuing to double down on our deep investment um, to expanding democracy and bringing more people who believe in the justice vision and who um, creating a, uh, not just a political change, because that's too small, it's really a cultural change where uh, people who are victims are believed as just, they're believed. And if you're under the age of 25 or you're, you're, you're coming of age in a time where you have a shot to be believed. In my day, if something happened to you and you were abused, you know, and so someone at work or someone in the dorm or someone in the community, you basically weren't believed. And so uh, I believe that we're on the right path in our art to justice, and it is very painful. Um, and that all of the uh, parts of our movement, the movement part, the political strategist part, and very bold, uh, politicians who are emboldened by both things can stand up. And I want to call out the really excellent work of our two women of color senators, Maisie Hirono uh, from Hawaii and our Kamala Harris. Uh, <laughs> our and I imagine the Senate Judiciary Committee with those uh, two voices uh, among those um, changed the ability and expanded our ability to uh, question more deeply and have a broader conversation nationally. So I don't want people to think we lost um, because it's a long line. Right, and building on that, I want to speak to what it did outside of Washington. I want to speak to the light and the voice that it gave to someone down here who feels like we lost, we did not lose. What other name do you know of a Supreme Court justice? We don't, we brought light to Ken. Kavanaugh because the issue was that big. People self-organized buses to go to DC. People use their vacation time to go fight this, right? So, it, it, so we're waking up to it. We, I spoke about a woman who said, I finally reported my employer. He harassed me for three years and I do not want to wait 30 years. That's power. Bringing light was what we did, giving a voice to those that didn't have one, but then building it into political power. I'm not supposed to be harassed by my employer. Shocker, right? I grew up like, yeah, you are. As a matter of fact, I had an employer believe that, that I owed him sex because he had hired me at 18, right? So now we have youth that is going to see that this is not normal. And that there are women like us, like you, out there every single day you know, fighting for that, fighting so that it is not normal. What was supposed to be a quiet nomination turned out to be the loudest fight. 
and we're not done.
And you know what we did at Next Gen America? We had so many young people, because we target young people like the folks in this audience to get out to vote in 11 different states. We had so many people sign up and then they were asking, what can we do? They are now texting voters. They are now calling voters. They are now knocking on doors. So don't cry when you lose. Fight. Okay? Yeah. And I just want Yes. Yes. To me, I'm dropping knowledge right here on the freedom. I just want to say we don't need Republican women to win. I just want us to get clear about this. And this is for Democrats to finally learn the lesson. We do not need conservative white voters. We just don't. So when we looked at the, the group who elected and re-elected Barack Obama, it's just a state, the re-election, we look at the nation's voters across the board. Uh, progressive white voters are 26% of white voters, or 26% of the nation's voters. And uh, people of color who are almost half of the population, you know that, right? We're almost half, majority of the state, um, half of the Democratic Party, but I'm talking about all voters. 23% of them are progressive voters, based on that measure. That's 51% of all voters. We call that multiracial group, that coalition, the new American majority. And so, so much energy and money is spent chasing after a uh, Republican White voters, we do not need them to win, but the door's wide open. Come on in if you want to join. But I'm talking about electoral victory means turning our people out to vote. People who are upset um, about uh, allowing powerful people to abuse other people and not being held to account. We want to see a deep and uh, like a uh, specific and sustained systemic change in our country. We have enough votes right now. We have enough votes to win. We have enough votes to win those congressional seats in Southern California, uh, gubernatorial seats um, in swing states. We have enough votes to win in Tennessee. We have enough votes. We just have to turn out. Our votes are not, our, our voters are not equally motivated by um, sexual abuse and we're not equally motivated, but there's a core of us, particularly women of color who are. And so to the extent that we invest in and lift up and that coalition and recognize who are the people who are gonna win at the polls, the sooner we do that, the more direct our, our day of victory at the polls are. I wanna go into our next question, but I also wanna say that, and this is just really what Michelle said, we need good white women like Professor Michelle to talk to other good moral white women who can vote the right way. We do need that. We do need our white sisters to talk to your white cousins and your white mothers and your white daughters and talk about these issues because these issues are affecting all women. We're talking about Me Too at the polls. So we need the white brothers too. Exactly. We need our men too. Yes. So some people have voiced and pushed back against the Me Too movement and saying that um, we've gone too far. Is this a political left or political right issue? Do you want to speak to that, Michelle? Uh, so no, I don't think that sexual violence is a left or right issue. I think it's not right or left, it's right and wrong. And I think that um, it is uh, important that there be accountability for uh, individuals. So I'll just give you an example. Um, one of the individuals, so we have several campaigns going in several states. One of the individuals that we targeted um, in, is in a solidly 70% Republican district in central Washington. His name is Matt Van Miller. He's a state representative. We're focusing on state representatives, and I want to say why that is. That's because it's much cheaper to get rid of. It's much more efficient. You can have a big influence on a state legislative race for $100,000. And if somebody would have taken out Roy Moore when he was trolling the shopping mall 30 years ago, he wouldn't have grown up to cause the most expensive uh, Senate race in American history. So I think you can get sort of bang for your buck by looking at the state races and you can also prevent them from abusing women for however many years they would be in power. So one of our guys in Washington that we're targeting um, uh, through a local uh, PAC, not through the um, national organization, um, he was a professor at University Central Washington University. He sexually harassed at least 16 undergraduate students. He um, had sex with at least two high school underage girls. And he was found in an independent investigation by the state to have um, done all of this. I mean, they did an independent investigation. They released an 85-page report. 
he does not deny the majority of these allegations, and he was still running for re-election. He was fired from his tenured university position, so he is a walking Title IX violation, and he was fired, and as a tenured professor, I can tell you, very hard to do. Um, the evidence has to be very compelling, and still he was running for re-election, and until we came into the race, he was slated to win again by 70% of the vote. And um, within two weeks of us uh, opening the local political action committee and funding it, he announced that he would resign even if he wins. And now that um, district looks like it might elect the first Democratic candidate um, in anyone's memory. And it will be in part with the votes of those Republican white women um, who were appalled by um, the extent of his behavior. So I do think that there is an opportunity there. And no, I don't think we've gone too far. I think we're just getting started on the accountability project. There are many, many, many Matt Manwellers out there. You would be shocked at the number of elected officials out there who there is compelling evidence that they have committed sexual violence, sexual harassment, domestic violence, child abuse, and they are running for re-election in supposedly safe seats. We need to make those seats Let's see. So 30 more seconds before we go to Q&A. What I would say about this is that it's not um, a right versus left issue, and it is a right versus wrong issue, and it's a clear challenge to um, the structural power, you know, that the, 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 the power structures that exist in all of our institutions, from the places that we work, from our government, you know, all up and down. And we know that power doesn't concede anything without a demand. Um, and so I think that there are um, things that we all have to do. It has not gone, to your point, it has not gone too far. It's going to continue to move forward. Because if we're going to see um, true equality for women, for other survivors, for allies, for gender non-conforming folks, this has to be the beginning and not the end. Thanks, Rachel. And can you uh, say your name and what city and um, state you live in? Yeah, it's not. Oh, it's working. Okay. There you go. Hi, I'm Bella. I live in California. I'm 15. Um, my question to you is, have you ever been sexually molested? And if so, how long did it take for you to recover? Because I have from 5th to 8th grade, and I can't get justice because they were underage. And I was wondering, how I can deal with that because I see one of them every day in my school. So, Bella, I'm just going to, is your mother here? No, she's at her, she's at our booth. Okay, do you have an adult woman that you can speak to, like a family member or a teacher yeah. that you trust? I've talked I've talk to my mom about it. Okay, and you're working with your mom and trying to get justice? We tried, we talked to the police, but they can't do anything because they were underage. I'm really sorry to hear about that. And you're in therapy? Are you getting counseling? Yes, yes, I am. I'm glad that you are. I, I just want to say, you know, when I was in school, I had an incident with a teacher. And, um, you know, when you have that um, betrayal of trust, when it's a teacher or even, you know, uh, someone who is your age, it is difficult to get through, but I went through counseling, I talked to my parents, and I just kept working through it. And I'm not gonna say that there's any time limit to healing, but what you're doing is some of the first steps towards healing. So I wish you well in that, and I'm sorry that this happened to you. But I'm glad you're talking to your mother. Thank you. I wanna say that you didn't do anything wrong. I wanna say that I wanna hug you and that it has happened to me. And I'm sorry that it has happened to you. It will take some time to heal. But I promise you that we will all support you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
of such fierce women with such incredible grace and empathy. Um, I want to say thank you uh, for my niece, Ricky, nine years old, yesterday called me to tell me that she made her elementary school debate team. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of you for my niece who just graduated from Harvard in the spring as an engineer. I want to say thank you for my own daughter. I, I really do. She's multi-ethnic and stunning and beautiful and smart and fierce. Her name's Rachel. It's an honor. You were all heroes in her household. I was raised by two smart, strong females. Amazing, my grandmother and my mother. And I just wanted the opportunity to say you, you are all spectacular, amazing, and I'm humbled. Thank you. And I love comments, but we love questions, particularly from the young people in the room. So we encourage more of you young people to stand up if you have questions. We accept all questions, but. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Annie Zonnevelt. I'm the founder and president of Muslims for Progressive Values, based here in Los Angeles with eight chapters across the U.S. and with other chapters in different countries. I'm Lincoln Lagansela. Um, I wanted to comment on uh, two comments, and then I have a specific question for you all. Um, I do think that it's important to reach out to our white brothers and sisters as well, Republicans or otherwise, because this is about values, and we need to go beyond the labeling. This is really, really key to the long-term sustainable development um, and the changing of hearts and mind, number one. And number two, I want to say to um, Amy, I think it's um, um, your, the, the minority is uh, uh, to appeal to women, minorities, this is key. But however, I think we need to really focus on um, what are their values? We have Nikki Haley, who's the U.S. ambassador, so she's a person of a color. So I'm just saying, I think just because you're a person of color does not necessarily mean that you actually share our values. When it comes to values, I want to really appeal to the progressive movement, especially you all up there. When you have... Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you a question just because we have 10 minutes when, left. When you, you have, have conservative yeah. women representing the Women's March, it's really problematic for me as a progressive Muslim who has always been progressive and advocating for women's rights and LGBT rights for 12 years at Pro, since Prop 8. For someone to come around one year when it's opportunistic, I think that's really problematic. I think we have to, as progressives, scratch the surface. Okay, you claim to be a progressive, so what really do you stand for, number one? And, and what have you done? Do you have a question? So the question is, okay. As a movement, are we going to do anything about the Equal Rights Amendment? This is key. This is legislation that can once and for all change the status of women in the United States. Amy, do you want to speak to Yeah. You got it in there. I want to go back. Okay. I, three things. One, mm -hmm. uh, women of color are not minorities yes, in California. Minorities. Please strike that from the record. Yeah. We're the majority of women, and <laughs> women are the majority of voters, so we're the biggest chunk. Uh, number two, there's always the Nikki Haley's and the Amoroses running around. They're outliers. And when we look at the majority of women of color, we are the most progressive at the polls, and that's what really counts in terms of institutionalizing our power. And third, the term women of color was born in uh, 1976 at the country's first and only women's uh, national convention in, in, in Texas. And it was there where you had the beginnings of the ERA national movement, and uh, that movement still exists today. I believe that's going to be, I believe, it's going to be in the context of talking about a women's party. If you're hip to that, people are talking about starting a political party, or it's going to be talking about um, having a constitutional amendment. I believe that the Kavanaugh hearings and the Me Too movement is going to result in that fundamental of a conversation. I think we also have to remember steps, too. We have political steps. So the Equal Rights uh, Amendment is something that, yes, we've been trying to get passed for a long time, but there are steps toward it, and there's some triage political things that we have to do. You were so we're one stage short, and yeah. I do uh, support the movement to ratify. I think there are some, there are some dicey legal questions, which I'd be happy to talk to you about afterwards, about what happens after that last day ratifies, because the time to ratify has technically expired, but I think that it would still be an important way forward. 
Hi, my name is Sumitra. I'm turning 19 this month, and I'm currently a political science major at Whittier College, and I'm taking a Women in News Politics course where I have to um, partake in an internship, so I'm currently entering with the Arsenal Youth Forums, where we promote civic in youth civic engagement. And I had a question. We talk about the Me Too movement a lot, um, especially dealing with the political realm and the Kavanaugh case in my course, and I was just wondering, what do you, who do you believe is going to be politically mobilizing the most in these upcoming midterms? Because I have heard multiple perspectives regarding either saying that conservatives are gonna be, I guess, turning out in the midterms more and just electing more because they want to remain being the majority in the House and everything like that. But at the same time, I've also heard that more liberals are young women and women of color. So I just wanted to hear your opinions about People that. like you are turning out. Yeah. People yeah. are registering to vote yeah. and showing up. They showed up and demonstrated this at primaries in key states around the country. And they are activated, you know, people like yourself. I think conservatives have always voted. I mean, they always go out to vote. But I think that if we have youth come out and show up to vote, do you realize that most voters that registered at 18 chose no party? Because what I did. Yes. <laughs> They're voting on values. So I think that if we vote on values but show up to vote, then we will be okay. I think conservatives have been really energized by the Kavanaugh uh, thing in a way that's very dangerous and concerning to me. And I think that in order to counteract that, progressives have to start, they, we have to stop running the same old white men candidates. If you look at where the voters are turning out, it's like for Ocasio-Cortez, you know, and it is for Beto. We need to get young voters engaged, and that means running candidates who excite the people that we need. We need to stop chasing, you know, the same group of voters with the same candidates and start figuring out how to get the millions of people who never vote engaged. And if you just look at the races that, you know, where young people are turning out, it's when we present them with a candidate that excites them. And so that's what I think we need to figure out how to do. Yes. Yes. I love your 30 seconds. Yeah, I love your question because it's the most important question about who's going to actually win in a, in a couple of weeks. And you'll notice that pollsters keep being surprised when you have the uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, oh, we never saw it coming, but also Ayanna Presley, who ran for uh, Congress, we never saw it coming. And also uh, Lauren Underwood, a black woman who's running, who beat out five white guys in her uh, suburban uh, Chicago uh, district, we never saw it coming. You know why they, those pollsters don't see it coming? They're not measuring young people, they're not measuring people of color, they're undersampling our communities and oversampling more conservative voters. They do not see it coming, coming and that's, uh, that's on the Democratic side as well as the Republican side. The reason why we believe that Republicans are energized is because they say it, but they lie. I don't believe that their turnout is going to be higher just because they say it's going to be higher. I believe that they want it to be higher, but in a midterm year where they're controlling all, form, all uh, parts of government, their turnout is going to be lower. And so um, I want to just point out the fact that uh, pollsters need to get with the program and start measuring uh, new uh, populations in order to really get a read on what's happening. So you, by even asking that question, if you're giving the answer, we actually don't know. Okay, so we have about three minutes left, so time for about one more question. Really quick. Hi, I'm Tony. I'm from California. Um, I just, uh, I have a little bit of concern because uh, I was around, though I was very little, um, during the feminist movement and the effort to achieve uh, the ERA. And um, I observed that uh, the ERA kind of hit a wall because there came a certain point when um, the politics became family issues. It started being talked about over the supper table and there was nothing in the, in the larger dialogue, the larger paradigm to help the men, white men, move to the point of understanding the necessity of the ERA. Now, I appreciate very much you saying. I just want to get to your question really quick, just because we, we have, have two minutes. To, my my question, question is, besides just saying we're going to hammer it through, is there no plan to address the paradigms themselves so that we don't have to count on always having you know majority at the polls? We actually move the whole culture forward. To, to Just remember, too, our panel's been saying we have the 
the majority already. Right. We have majority. We have to think empowerment and know our power. But I'll let the panel answer the question. All I'm going to say is it's a good question because we need culture change. Right after I want to take a note from the LGBT marriage equality movement. They they yeah. walked it. They lost in California. Remember Prop 8? Yeah. Okay, returning California has passed that terrible uh, uh, legislation two years later. Two years later. Yeah. So they were able yeah. to achieve massive cultural change, but they used electoral power as a lever, and they didn't go after people who were opposed to their very existence. They went after elevating those, a coalition, we don't all think the same, but a coalition of people who recognize the basic humanity and rights of LGBT people, and that was enough to win, and now uh, the culture has changed. And also, I was at GLAD, which is the Gay Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation at that time, and I know that we were all watching the returns that night and thinking, we just got set back a decade. Two years later, I was graduating um, grad school. It was like one of those times when you're in between houses and you're moving, you know, and I was at, in a hotel. And, and I was like, oh look, New York just legalized marriage. This is how, and that was my reaction. It was like, oh my God, because in those two years, so much had changed where we would thought every, the world had ended. And how that happened was individual conversations. If you go to GLAD or you go to the Movement Advancement Project, what happened was there was a campaign for people, for, for queer folks to talk to folks and to tell you, it's called, there's a, there's a whole series called Talking About. It teaches you how to tell folks about your issues and values and why actually we're not on different pages value-wise. Who, who in this room, or even if you sat in a Trump rally, who, who could say you don't want a better future for your kids? You don't want, you know, if you get sick, you don't want to, you know, be taken care of or have a warm bed. You know, and so when you make those connections, maybe you're not going to get everybody, but there's a movable middle right in between there that we are able to, to not only to, um, to persuade, but also people who are in the middle who already agree but just aren't active. Thank so this is what we need to do. Thank you, Rachel. Thank, Thank you, to call. Yeah. Well, Thank I mean, also, who is pro-rape? I mean, you know, ultimately, you know, we're in the middle of a seismic shift on the subject of sexual violence and sexual harassment. And so many people are coming forward and telling their stories about this to their family members, to people they know, in their communities, um, on videos, on the internet. The genie is not going back in the bottle. Exactly. Okay? And, I, and that is not going to change. So exactly. those conversations are happening. I just want to thank you so much, Michelle. I just want to take the time to thank all the panels, thank all of you for coming and attending. I know this is short, but you know, we're trying to keep this